Mr. Speaker, <coughs> over the last couple of weeks, I've heard some new titles bestowed on the Prime Minister. And I have to say, after hearing that presentation by the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, I have to concur with every single one of them. The Prime Minister, the member from Castries, yes, Mr. Speaker, cannot even present a proper justification for something as simple as waiving that on the operations of National Trust without attempting to politicize it. That's okay. I think me and the rest of St. Lucia have really become very accustomed to these kind of presentations in the House. So given that this level of latitude was given to the member, I'm hoping that the speaker will find it in his own heart to allow me to respond to some of the issues that were brought up. First of all, National Trust is a statutory agency. And as I have said in the past, Mr. Speaker, it is an agency that in many ways is conflicted because it has a board of persons that believe in conservation. But at the same time, it is an entity that over time has been vested lands by the government and the people of Solution. And many people have believed that a lot of that has been to preserve from an environmental perspective those lands. But at the same time, some of those lands, and the Prime Minister made reference to the, he didn't really finish the story, but I, I've, I have no idea what he's talking about, but um, reference to the president of, of Mexico's house and some prison. I, I mean, I think what he means to say is that you can have a historical site that can also be commercial or have a, a multiple functions at the same time. <coughs> Further evidence of the problem that the National Trust is facing, Mr. Speaker, is exactly why I believe the Prime Minister has come to the House to seek our support to allow the National Trust to operate VAT free. So instead of having to pay VAT like all of the commercial entities, they're going to do so. And I genuinely believe, Mr. Speaker, that if in fact that the only and sole reason why National Trust existed was to be a conservationist and a protector, and they were not going to be involved in any level of commercial activity, then I think I would have zero difficulties with it. But we start crossing a line because the, the member from Castries brings up I, I, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we're going to start discussing jazz festival. So are we meant to believe that part of the negotiations that's taking place here with the National Trust is a quid pro quo? That the government is now going to let them have VAT free and in somehow there's going to be some better relationship between the National Trust and um, the government as it pertains to jazz? Right? So Mr. Speaker, I love that to know, Mr. Speaker. The member from Denry speaking about the victimization. That's the narrative that the Labour Party has wanted to peddle forever. That's what, but you see, Mr. Speaker, it is now catching up with them. It is now catching up with them. The fact is, is that there has to be negotiation with the National Trust and the subvention that had always been given to the National Trust, which started off at 200,000, by the time I got into office was 700,000. And instead of that subvention being used for capital expender projects, that subvention was being used to pay salaries. You're talking about an entity that is a commercial entity that is making money off of Pigeon Island and making money off of its other entities. And the question is the conflict that exists within the trust itself as to why they cannot be one thing or the other. So, is there a possibility of developing Pigeon Island? Member from Microsoft, you've asked me for latitude. But what you're doing there is asking me to abandon the standing orders altogether. 
this is a debate. The member for Castro is, is made certain points. The latitude you request is to respond to those points, not to give the historicity of the National Trust. So the member didn't make comments about restoration of the subvention. You can deal with that. But you are asking me to abandon the standing orders altogether and not give you latitude. So I am prepared to give you the latitude, but you've gone so far away from aligning yourself with either the comments made or the resolution before us that I can't permit it. So yes, you have your latitude because the member did make some points <coughs> out with of the resolution, but you you have made a quantum leap yourself. So please proceed, but within the guidelines. So, Mr. Speaker, I think that you and I are going to be in trouble because I have not even begun to take my latitude because my conversation has been at this point well, restricted. I can only tell you. In this house, there is only one speaker. So the, you, you will not be in problems with me. You won't be in problems with me. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if your English is different than my English. But right now, I have been keeping and restricting my conversation about the National Trust, if I'm not mistaken. And please guide me, Mr. Speaker. Are we not discussing the uh, application for there to be a waiver of the um, uh, value-added tax for National Trust? Is that not what we're debating? I have given you my guidelines, Mr. Mr. Speaker, so I'm, I need your guidelines because here it is. I have not even began to express my latitude because we have to go to the, uh, the, the governor of the central bank. I've not gotten there yet. I'm still only dealing right now with the National Trust and the, and the request by the member from Castries East that we approve in this house the waiver of the VAT for National Trust. That's what I've been talking about. I'm not talking about anything else. And I'm saying that the National Trust has two relationships. One, it's a conservationist, and at the same time, it is managing properties. It's commercial. Is there not an expectation, some expectation, Mr. Speaker, that as the government and as taxpayers of this country, that's who we represent. We represent the taxpayers. Is it not fair to ask, what has the National Trust been doing in order to reduce the burden of the taxpayers, especially when the state and the people of this country have bestowed and given them that much land. What are they doing with it? Okay, so what are we doing to use Pigeon Island to generate more resources on a regular basis? I remember when I was Prime Minister and I asked the National Trust that same question, Mr. Speaker, which comes to the issue that the Prime Minister raised to say that somehow that we, uh, I can't even remember the word that he used, um, that we, we penalized, penalized the, uh, the, the National Trust because we took away their subvention. We took away, the, we didn't take away the subvention, we withheld the subvention on the basis that they would be providing a business plan for, may I be protected? We, we withheld the subvention. We withheld the subvention, Mr. Speaker, on the basis that the National Trust was supposed to present a plan on how they were going to run their affairs, how they were going to support themselves. Because as I said, the subvention was being given for capital investment for them to be at some point self-sufficient. The plan that was presented, Mr. Speaker, to me when I was Prime Minister, and, and the, the member from Castries would know that's normally the Prime Minister that the trust responds to, was that they wanted to build and convert the museum that they had into a conference facility. Well, it's not me, Mr. Speaker. It's not me who built. They came up with the idea and a store at the front. They had, they had a feasibility that was done when they eventually provided the feasibility study to us, Mr. Speaker, the feasibility gave them the answer that that was not going to work. And remember, that is long before the Royalton Hotel was built and before Harbor Club was built. And the study showed them that, that there was nothing unique about making that a conference facility. So again, we had multiple discussions with them. And one of them, Mr. Speaker, 
was if we're doing a jazz festival and we showed that over a 20 year period, Mr. Speaker, that the, not, the tourist board had spent in excess of $25 million over 20 years in putting up stages and breaking down stages and preparing Pigeon Island for the event. Imagine if that money was invested in putting a permanent stage up at Pigeon Island and making it now a world-class amphitheater. And that in addition to being able to host the jazz festival and any of the other festivals that the government likes, is that we now would have introduced for the first time, Mr. Speaker, a permanent stage for the arts. That we could have had now a dance show, we could have had a theatrical show, a musical show that would have been also for dinner. Because you know, we have a problem, Mr. Speaker. We keep complaining about the number of all-inclusive hotels that we have, and the way in order to get the people out of the all-inclusive hotels is to generate a revenue opportunity for everyone, Mr. Speaker. Okay? Oh, no, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to love, I'm going to, I, I'm going to really enjoy myself today with the kind of heckling that I'm, I'm hearing this today. So they're saying to me, Mr. Speaker, I was there for six years, we did not get it done. But yet, this is the same group of people that said that we acted as autocrats and were forcing the trust to do what we didn't want to do. That's not true. That's for the trust to make a determination. All the government can say is, come up with an idea that is going to allow the National Trust to be commercially self-sustaining. You have assets, whether it's Maria Island, whether it's Fondor, whether it's a whole bunch of other sites that they have, what are you doing to apply them to make them more viable? It cannot be them to just sit there and look pretty. And then, you know, Mr. Speaker, the whole issue of the Dolphin Park came in, and the, you know, the members on the opposite side talk about um, misleading people. Their own people were going out and saying that we wanted to build a sea aquarium on Pigeon Island. Nothing further from the truth. Absolutely nothing. In fact, what was being done was a dolphin pen in the ocean. And what would have done? It meant you had a half day tour with the dolphin park and you would have had a half day tour with Pigeon Island. Mr. Speaker, so if you take between putting up a permanent stage that can do evening shows 52 weeks of the year and also to be able to host all of our different events and generate money the simple calculation was is that the National Trust could have made a profit of almost $7 million just on the theater show. Far less, another $2 million that they could have made easily off of the Dolphin Park. So Mr. Speaker, well, we can sit down, we can go through the numbers, not a problem. But again, Mr. Speaker, this is a government that we don't have to guess anymore. When they were in opposition, they were beating pans. They had no plans. And after being three years in government, and still with the pressure that you have, there's still no plans, Mr. Speaker. Here is it you want to call National Trust. You want to go and give them a waiver? No problem. But what's the plan? It cannot be that it's just about lay, laying up and giving you an easier time with, uh, not with uh, the Jazz Festival. Where's the investment in, in Pigeon Island that's going to make it world class? And that's what distinguishes St. Lucia. And its event has always been Pigeon Island. Pigeon Island is the thing that changes us. And nobody else could have. If you now have, if you now have Mr. Speaker, cruise ships, and you can encourage cruise ships to stay in port later at night because we have an activity that we can sell them, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> So this is the difficulty, and I'm glad to hear the Prime Minister is what, somewhat agreeing with that, is that there has to be a discussion with the National Trust and a fairness. How are they going to add value to the development of our country? And it can't just be about conservation at the cost of the taxpayers. Therefore, why give them the assets? And that's the problem, is you have a situation where you have a board that is conservation-minded, and I have no difficulties with that, but then you have a management team that does not know how to be able to, to balance that. And I can see that the government is having the same difficulties. So there was never here of anybody wanting to um, penalize the National Trust. It was holding the National Trust accountable to the taxpayer's money. And I believe every St. Lucian would respect that. Every single one.
But instead, we have a government that just wants to give away the money and not be accountable for the money. So, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the member from Castries East, Mr. Speaker, brought up about making derogatory remarks about the Governor General. Governor of Central Bank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Making derogatory remarks. And I've personally spoken to the Governor. And I said to him, you came on a TV show and you said that the 2.5% levy for security and health was going to a good cause. We have found out in this house, Mr. Speaker, that the money is not going to security and it's not going to health. And I asked him, I said, when you are going to come here to make a presentation, you ought to have at least done your own research or have your team do the research. Because one week before you came, there was a letter from the Medical and Dental Association that described the situation with health in this country as the worst that it's ever been and gave a horrific description of what's going on. In fact, the letter, Mr. Speaker, forewarned, forewarned that if in fact the situation was not resolved, there would be, there would be further resignations. And they were. So I asked the governor, how is it you can go, come to St. Lucia and make comments like that? Okay? And that is completely contrary to the, what the facts are on the ground. That's the question. So, Mr. Speaker, how can the, gov how can the governor come here and, and make those kind of statements? That's egregious. It's unacceptable. So you cannot come and make allegations or suggestions to the general public that the money is going to a cause in which we all know and the public knows it's not happening. We have a crisis right now, Mr. Speaker, taking place in Castries, in Castries Basin. None of the healthcare centers are working. None. But I'm going to, I'm going to show you, Mr. Speaker, how unimaginative that this government is. And that lack of imagination comes from the fact that they have no sense of urgency as to what people are feeling on the ground. So you're talking about Castries East, the Prime Minister, Castries North, the, was it the Senior Minister? Castries South, the Deputy Prime Minister, and Castries Central, the want-to-be Prime Minister, four of the most senior people in your cabinet. All of them, no healthcare centers working in the Castries Basin. And instead of the member from Castries Central on his show dealing with the crisis it had, instead, he's there trying to, to find 99,000 reasons why the, 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 the PS building or home is okay. But that's all right. But meanwhile, Mr. Speaker, while I was in... Member for Castries Central. Mr. 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 Speaker, I am a politician and I expect judge, but it's just on a point of order. Making inferences to someone who's not present in the house in a derogatory manner. He referred to my PS and talk about 99,000 reasons. This is the very prime minister, Mr. Speaker. Well, what, what's, the, what's, the point of, what's the point of order? The member? point of order is he, he, he makes reference to my permanent secretary who is not involved in politics, who is not in the house, and who cannot defend herself from his remarks in this chamber. But what, what is it that he said that requires a defense? He referenced my PS. No, all he said was rather than deal with something, pertinent to the nation's business, you instead spend the time on your show defending your peers. That's all he said. In building her house. But that's what you said. Mr. Speaker, he referred to in building her house. Well, he never suggested the building was improper. He was simply saying that's what you spend your time on as opposed defending to... Defending building her house? I didn't say defending He didn't say that. What did you say? All he simply said was you, you, you spent, you look for 99,000 reasons Defending something, ra and then rather than dealing the nation's business, you were defending the building of your house by your peers. I didn't say the building. There is Mr. nothing derogatory about it. M M Mr. Speaker, if that is your ruling, I have to abide by your finding. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping, the same degree of latitude afforded to the honourable member would be afforded to your humble servant. You, you will be afforded latitude. 
but certainly there is nothing affording him latitude on that statement. Yes, but Mr. we are dealing with VAT exemption for the um, National Trust, and my PS's house found its way into that argument. So I'm saying in a very crafty way, other things can come into the argument, Mr. Speaker. Fair enough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The point I was trying to make, Mr. Speaker, of the lack of imagination and the lack of any urgency by this government, which is certainly displayed in the presentation of this, of this, of this motion. While I was Prime Minister, one of the things I had negotiated, Mr. Speaker, with the U.S. government was to get a mobile um, hospital. In fact, after the elections, the uh, then ambassador came over and I remember the presentation um, of that said hospital, which I assume is in storage. Now, you would have thought that the four senior people, the Prime Minister, the Senior Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the want-to-be Prime Minister, in Cabinet, understanding there's no health care facilities available to the people in, in the Cassius Basin. And the only place they can go to now is OKEU, which is in chaos. Why don't take out the hospital out of storage and put it somewhere in Cassius and give some relief to OKEU and give some relief to the people of St. Lucia? But it's that lack of imagination, Mr. Speaker, that lack of sense of urgency that worries me. So even when the Prime Minister, the member from Cassius East, Mr. Speaker, wants to make references to what took place at the um, uh, custody suites, the prison. He knows, but he chooses not to repeat it, Mr. Speaker. The National Trust is a very special organization and that it identifies and posts historical buildings. <laughs> it has that right, Mr. Speaker. That's the strength the National Trust has. And when it goes around and it sees buildings of historic importance, it registers those buildings as historically important and significant buildings. What does that do, Mr. Speaker? That means if anybody applies to make any changes to those buildings in any way, that the first entity that must give the approval for that to take place is the National Trust. Very important, the National Trust. They would have the ultimate say. But it was interesting to note, Mr. Speaker, that the prison, which has been described by many people as a hellhole, and some persons saying that it should have been burnt down long ago, and that it's a shame of our own past, was never put as a historical building. Never. So in fact, the court case in which the National Trust took the government to court, the results of that court case was that the government acquiesced to the National Trust and said, we will revisit it one more time. But the decision as to whether we're going to keep the building or not is ultimately and belongs solely to the government. So in fact, the architects and everybody tried to figure out exactly what the Prime Minister, I think that was he was trying to suggest, Mr. Speaker, as to how that old building could have been incorporated into the new building. And there was no way of doing it because the wall structure was not strong enough. It would not have been able to support that. So the idea was to take relics of it and incorporate it into the new courthouse and the new police headquarters that were going to be created. So Mr. Speaker, I think that most St. Lucians now have picked up on the fact that while the, this government was in opposition, that they made a lot of wild allegations. Not dissimilar to the minister's presentation that I heard, and I know I'm not allowed to go down that road, and I'll leave that for another day. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, the members on the opposite side don't have any imagination. And I'm concerned that they're bringing this bill to the House, this motion to the House, simply to try to have a quid pro quo with the National Trust in order to get the National Trust to allow them to hold the Jazz Festival, rather than making a permanent investment in the Pigeon Island, creating a stage that can be used all year, can create jobs for young people, Mr. Speaker. That we'd have jobs where musicians can be hired full time. We have dancers that could be hired full time. We can have actors that are, actor, are gonna be hired full time and put our arts on display in the premier location in the world, Pigeon Island. And that it would significantly enhance for locals because we get a cultural experience 
gone are the days when a, a, a friends of yours come down and you have somewhere other than Friday night at Grosley to take them? Will we be able to take them to a cultural show? Those are the things, Mr. Speaker. If we're going to integrate and benefit from tourism, let's do it. But this idea that you want to believe, make it believe that the members on the opposite side and the United Workers' Party in particular, Mr. Speaker, don't have a vision with National Trust. We do. We support the National Trust. We think they play a very important role. And as an environmental group, we do. But we, we have questions, and we're going to challenge them when it comes to the commercial development of the properties. It cannot be that the taxpayers of this country are going to be asked year after year to keep putting money into the National Trust, and there's no accountability. And I think that the direction that the government is going in because the government certainly has not offered any explanation as to any dialogue that they've had with National Trust to say that the trust is going to change its ways, is going to, how is it going to make investments, why is the VAT money needed? The VAT money tells me that things are financially worse with the trust than ever before. And if we think making them not have to pay VAT is going to solve the problem, it's not. We need, to, we need to work with the trust to get them to understand that they have two very clear objectives that are in conflict with each other. One is a conservationist, and the other one is to be able to develop properties. You know, Mr. Speaker, I remember when we first did the Jazz Festival, and Coco, Coco Charles, when we applied to the National Trust to host the first Jazz Festival on Pigeon Island. The National Trust said no, Mr. Speaker. They turned down the St. Lucia Tourist Board. And the person who called me when I was young director of tourism at that point, called me and said, was Coco Charles, he said, Mr. Chastney, can you take me and explain to me what the vision for Pigeon Island is and Jazz Festival? And I took him there. For those of us who are old enough, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you and I are probably in that, in that category. The first Jazz Festival, if you remember, the stage was facing um, uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean and was at the bottom, right? And when I took him there and I said, look, you have a stage down below, which you're now looking to Turtle Island, the Bird's Island, and then you're also looking back now at the Pigeon Island itself and all the wind comes from the back, Mr. Speaker. And that there was this amp natural amphitheater that was there. And Coco Charles cried. And he said, you know what, I have come I've been here my whole life, Mr. Speaker, and I have never seen that. And it was he, Mr. Speaker, that was able to go and convince the rest of the National Trust, Robert DeVoe and the others, to allow us to put the pigeon on. And you know, Mr. Speaker, the first time we built the stage, Mr. Speaker, okay, they would not allow us to put the metal stakes in the ground. Okay? In fact, we had to build the stage on stones, and I remember after we, we had to steal, we had to steal, we had to steal the, the piano, Mr. Speaker, from the cultural center, okay? And brought it up there. And I remember Winton Marcellus going up to play and he could not believe he was gonna go and play on stones. So Mr. Speaker, there's a history. And the fact is, is that we have spent millions of dollars every year on the Jazz Festival. Millions. And that's just the Jazz Festival. Far less the other festivals that have taken place on Pigeon Island, okay? And the question is, is that good value? So if we're going to spend the money and we all recognize the value and the importance of Pigeon Island as a landmark, something that's going to distinguish us, make us a marquee destination, why is it we can't sit down with the, with the National Trust? And the fact is the National Trust is the custodian and are the custodians of Pigeon Island. And there's no way that me as a government was going to force them to do anything but I certainly wanted them to know and appreciate that you cannot continue to expect that the state should fund all of your losses. And that's my concern, Mr. Speaker. I'm not hearing anything in the presentation today, and I'm hoping that the Prime Minister in his rebuttal will deal with that. How are you going to hold the trust accountable so that this money is not wasted? How are we going to be satisfied in this house, Mr. Speaker? Representing our constituents, representing the taxpayers of this country, Mr. Speaker. How are we going to be satisfied that this money that we're giving them, because this is, this is taxpayers' money, in exempting them from having to pay the VAT is money that would normally be coming to the state. Instead, we're allowing the trust to maintain those monies. How are we going to be assured? I've heard nothing in the presentation today, Mr. Speaker, that would give me any comfort 
that the National Trust is, is recognizing their conflict, is going to make an effort to meet their own um, cost, and more importantly, that they're going to add value to the destination of St. Lucia through historical sites and throughout culture. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.